projectile motion with resistance proportional to velocity. Before we jump into projectile motion with resistance proportional to the velocity, we're going to look at projectile motion experiencing no resistance at all. And let's draw up a, a little diagram to help us visualize things. So if we have our x, y axis, the projectile motion with no resistance will take shape of a parabola and we're going to launch the projectile with an initial velocity u, an angle of theta, and the only force it experiences here is the acceleration due to gravity in the y direction. So somewhere up here, it'll have some velocity v, and the way we're going to look at it, we're going to, we're going to break up the velocity components into their x and y components. So here, initially, we'll have an initial velocity in the y direction and an initial velocity in the x direction. And at some point over here, we'll have velocities in the x and y direction. Now, the velocity in the x direction, we can call that x dot, and the velocity in the y direction, we can call y dot, which means acceleration in the x direction is going to be x double dot, and the acceleration in the y direction is going to be y double dot. Now, when we're firstly, we're going to look at with no resistance in the x direction, which means x double dot's going to be zero because there's no drag. But in the y direction, we've got acceleration due to gravity acting downwards, so it's going to be minus g. And we're going to start off with these two equations. We're going to have x double dot equals zero and y double dot equals zero. But before we do that, we might just get some expressions for the initial velocity in the x direction and the initial velocity in the y direction. So the initial velocity in the x direction, we can imagine this being a right angle triangle with u being the hypotenuse. The initial velocity in the x direction there and the initial velocity in the y direction there and it's launched at an angle of theta. And using that right angle triangle, we'll get expressions for the velocity in the x direction being u cos theta, and the velocity in the y direction being u sine theta. And now we have everything we need to get the equations of motion for this projectile. And to do that, we're, we're going to integrate, but sorry, this y should be y double dot should equal minus g not zero. Yeah is minus g and now we can integrate both sides in both equations we'll go one at a time we'll, we'll do it with x first so we're going to integrate both sides with respect to time because remember x double dot is always with respect to time and then when we integrate x double dot we get x dot so the which is the velocity in the x direction and integrating zero with respect to time is just going to give us some constant. And how are we going to work out this constant? Well, we know that initially, when time is equal to zero, the velocity in the x direction is just equal to the initial velocity in the x direction, which is u cos theta. So when time is equal to zero, x dot actually equals u cos theta, which means that x dot, sorry, we can sub in that value for x dot, and there's no time, there's no time here, so we don't have to sub t zero anywhere because the it's not dependent on time, and we get that value for c, which means x dot 
is equal to u cos theta at every instance for time. So the velocity in the x direction is not dependent on the time of, of the flight. Now from here, again, we want to integrate both sides to get the displacement in the x direction. And again, with respect to time, so integrating x dots just going to give us x. Integrating this with respect to time is going to give us ut cos theta, because u cos theta is just a constant. And we get plus our constant. And we just have to look at our initial conditions again. So when time is equal to zero, x is also equal to zero. So if we sub in t is equal to zero and x is equal to zero, we'll just get c equals zero. So therefore, our final displacement in the x direction is equal to ut cos theta. So let's, let's go ahead and do the same thing for y, y double dot. So we're going to integrate both sides, again with respect to time. This is going to give us y dot. Integrating minus g with respect to time is going to give us minus gt, and we get plus our constant. And again, we're going to look at the initial conditions to figure out c. We know when time is equal to zero, our y dot is just going to be, our velocity is just going to be the initial velocity in the y direction, so uy, which is actually equal to u sine theta. Let's go ahead and sub those in. So when time is equal to zero, we know y dot equals u sine theta. So that's going to equal minus g times t, which is zero in this case. Well, this is zero, so we get c is equal to u sine theta. That means y dot equals minus gt plus u sine theta. And let's go ahead and integrate both sides again with respect to time. So integrating y dot is going to give us y. Integrating minus gt with respect to time is going to give us minus a half gt squared, because it's got a t value in there. And integrating u sine theta is just going to be ut sine theta, because u sine theta is just a constant because it doesn't have any, any t's in there. And we get plus our constant. And again, let's look at our initial conditions to figure out the value of c. And we know when t is equal to zero, y also equals zero. So it's at this point, if you were launching not from the origin, maybe somewhere higher, that you would have to put in that value for y initially. But here we're launching from the origin. So when t is equal to zero, y is equal to zero. And if you did that, if you sub t is equal to zero, all those terms would go, y would be zero, so c would also be zero. So therefore, your final equation for the displacement in the y direction is going to be y equals minus a half gt squared plus ut sine theta. And now that we've looked at the situation with, with no resistance, we're ready to Look at what happens when the resistance is proportional to the velocity. So let's, let's draw another diagram, and it's, it's going to be very similar. We've got our x and y axis. We're launching a projectile from the origin, but instead of being in the perfect shape of a parabola, it will decay a little bit and drop a little bit quicker if there's any resistance in the x direction. So again, we're still launching with an initial velocity at an angle of theta. At some point, we have our expression for our velocity, which again can be broken up into its x and y components. But this time, there'll be a force opposing the velocity in the exact opposite direction. And that force, if it's proportional to the velocity, will be k times v. So let's go ahead and break up our components again. So initially, we have a velocity in the x direction and a velocity in the y direction, initially. This velocity will also 
have velocities in the x and y direction, so this one being x dot and this one being y dot, but then the, the resistance that's proportional to the velocity also can be broken up into the opposite directions, with this one being k y dot and k x dot, so breaking them up into the appropriate components. And that resistance is acting on the object the entire time during the flight. So this time when we set up our initial equations, we've got our acceleration in the x direction and our acceleration in the y direction. With no resistance, the acceleration in the x direction was equal to zero. But now, it's actually going to be equal to minus kx dot. Because it's we have the x component of the resistance. And in the y direction, we're going to still have our gravity acting downwards, then also the resistance that it's also proportional to in the y direction. And now we want to go ahead and integrate both of these equations using our initial conditions as we did with uh, no resistance. So let's focus on x first. But first let's, we need to rewrite x double dot as the derivative of x dot with respect to time equals minus k x dot. And we can't integrate just yet because, again, we can't, we can't imagine moving the dt to the other side. We'd, we'd love to be able to move the dx dot if it was in the denominator. So we're going to take the reciprocal of both sides. So we're going to have dt over dx dot equals minus 1 on kx dot. And now we can go ahead and take the integral of both sides. So let's do that, taking the integral of both sides, and we can imagine the dx dot going to the other side. So this is just going to be, oh, let's, let's throw some bounds on the integral so we don't have to deal with a constant. So on the left, we're talking about time, and we know initially time is equal to zero, and we want to get to some, some time t. And on the right, we're dealing with x dot, and we know initially the velocity in the x direction is equal to u cos theta, just as it was with no resistance. And we're going to get to some final value for x dot, or at any point during, during the time of flight. So on the left, the integral of dt is just going to be t, bound between t and zero. On the right, we can take the minus 1 on k out, and then we're just going to be left with 1 on x dot, and the integral of 1 on x dot with respect to x dot is the natural log of the absolute value of x dot, bound between u cos theta and x dot, and now we can sub those bounds in. So subbing in t for t, we're going to get t. Minus something in 0 for t, we're going to get 0, so it's just going to be give us t. Here we're going to get the minus 1 on k, all outside of something in x dot. For x dot, we're just going to get the natural log of the absolute value of x dot, minus something in u cos theta for x dot, the natural log of u cos theta, all absolute value. And now we're trying to get x dot as the subject. We, want, we would like an expression for, for x dot. So let's multiply both sides by negative k to cancel out with that fraction and we'll combine our logs since we have the difference of two logs with the same base. That'll be the log of a quotient. So minusing, timesing both sides by negative k is going to give us minus kt equals Combining those logs, we're going to get the natural log of the absolute value of x dot over u cos theta. And now we can make both sides powers of e. So we're going to make the left-hand side a power of e and the right-hand side a power of e. 
So the E and the LNs cancel out. So we're going to be left with the absolute value of x dot over u cos theta equals e to the minus kt. And here the absolute value tells us we could take a plus or minus on the right hand side, but we're not going to do that because we're only going to take the positive case because with any kind of motion, we, we have the option to define positives and negatives with the directions we take and we're assuming everything acting to the right and up is positive and we've taken that into consideration so we can just drop the absolute value here because this is a mathematical model where you have to make those, those kind of decisions and we're just left with x dot over u cos theta equals e to the minus kt and timesing both sides by u cos theta we're going to get x dot equals u cos theta times e to the minus kt and this is our expression for velocity in the x direction if you can remember velocity in the x direction before with no resistance was equal to x dot was equal to just u cos theta and it wasn't dependent on time it never changed it never changed in the notion but now we're also multiplying by this e to the minus kt where k is just some constant here that tells us it's proportional the resistance was proportional to the velocity and since it's exponential it tells us that the longer this goes on for the faster the velocity decays because since this is negative this is going to make the velocity decay quick so the beginning of the motion will often start off just like a parabola but then decays quickly um, as time goes on and we're still not there yet we still need an expression for the displacement in the x direction so we can integrate both sides again and let's rewrite x dot as as d, d dx on dt and we're left with the integral of u cos theta e to the minus kt and here we actually can integrate straight away because our right hand side is in terms of time and we have the dt on the bottom and let's throw some bounds in so we don't get a constant so on the left we're dealing with x we know initially x is equal to zero and we're going to get some value of x in the end on the right we're dealing with time we know initially time is equal to zero and we want some value of time here so the integral of dx dt is just going to be x bound between zero and x over here we can actually take the u cos theta outside the integral since it's not dependent on time so we get u cos theta all outside of the integral of e to the minus kt we have to divide divide by the derivative of the power which is minus k so we're going to get minus 1 on k e to the minus kt bound between 0 and t and let's go ahead and sub those in and tidy everything up so subbing in x for x we get x minus subbing in 0 for x we get 0 so it's just gone we have our u cos theta all outside of we've got to sub in t for t so we're just going to get minus 1 on k e to the minus kt minus subbing in 0 for t we're going to get e to the 0 which is 1 times minus 1 on k which is minus 1 on k and let's let's fix this up so we're going to get x equals u cos theta all outside of minus 1 on k e to the minus kt minus minus turns into a plus so we get 1 on k let's factor out the 1 on k so we'll get x equals u cos theta all on k outside of we'll write our 1 on k term first as 1 and minus we've taken the 1 on k out so we get e to the minus kt for our final displacement in the x direction so so far we have three equations describing this motion. We have 
and we have four actually. We have the acceleration in the x direction, the velocity in the x direction, which was over here, and the displacement in the x direction, and we have the acceleration in the y direction. So now we're going to deal with y and integrate both sides here to get our velocity in the y direction and displacement in the y direction. So we had y double dot was equal to minus g minus ky dot. And we're after an equation for, for y dot, where we're going to need to integrate both sides. So let's, re let's rewrite y dot as the derivative of y dot dt equals minus g minus ky dot. And we can't integrate both sides just yet because we have our dt on the bottom, but this is not with respect to t, it's with respect to y dot. So let's take the reciprocal of both sides. So we're going to get dt over dy dot equals minus 1 over g plus ky dot. So I've just decided to move the negative up into the numerator and which would make g and y dot positive. And now we're ready to take the integral of both sides here. So we're going to take the integral of both sides and let's add some bounds on it. So on the left we're dealing with time and we know initially time is equal to 0 and we want to get to some time t. On the right, we're dealing with y dot, and initially y dot is equal to u sine theta, and we want to get to some final value of y dot. On the left, integrating dt, we're just going to get t, bound between 0 and t. On the right, Let's just consider the derivative of the denominator here, which is with respect to y dot, which is just k. So if we had k on the numerator, we'd know that the integral of this would be a natural log, but we can take the negative out and add our own k up there. So we're taking the negative out, timesing this by k, and then dividing by k. And doing that gives us minus 1 on k and then the integral of this becomes the natural log of the absolute value of g plus k y dot bound between u sine theta and y dot. Let's go ahead and sub all those values in. So subbing in t for t we're going to get t, subbing in 0 for t and minusing we're just going to get 0 so we've just left with t, minus 1 on k, all outside of, we're subbing in y dot first, we're going to get the natural log of the absolute value of g plus k y dot, minus subbing in u sine theta for y dot, we're going to get minus the natural log of the absolute value of g plus k times y dot, which is u sine theta, all absolute value, and let's go ahead and times both sides by minus k and combine the logs together. So doing that, we're going to get minus kt times by both sides by minus k, and then combining the logs together, we're going to get the natural log of the absolute value of g plus ky dot all over g plus u times k of sine theta and let's go ahead now and make both sides powers of e so we can cancel out the the natural log there so then we're going to get g plus ky dot all over g plus uk sine theta equals e to the minus kt and all we have to do now is make y dot the subject so let's go ahead and times both sides by the denominator. So we're left with g plus k y dot 
equals g plus uk sine theta all multiplied by e to the minus kt then we're going to minus g from both sides then divide by k so we're left with right down here we'll go we're left with y dot so we're first minusing g from both sides we're left with g plus uk sine theta times e to the minus kt minus g then dividing both sides by k we'll just get multiplied by 1 on k and there's our final expression for the velocity in the y direction now we need the displacement in the y direction so we're going to go ahead and integrate both sides here but before we do that we'll write so let's just make a note this is our acceleration in the y direction this is our velocity in the y direction we just need a displacement in the y direction now so let's rewrite, rewrite y dot as dy dt let's write the one on k out the front and this is all multiplied by g plus uk sine theta times e to the minus kt minus g now we can integrate both sides here straight away because we have a dt here and everything is this is in terms of t so let's go ahead and integrate and throw our bounds in now for y we know initially y is zero and we're going to get to some value of y for time our initial time is zero and we want to get to some value of time t so integrating that left hand side with respect to y we're just going to get y down between zero and y equals the right hand side the right hand side we should probably tidy up first and expand everything out so we can integrate separately so we're going to go bound between zero and t so let's expand everything out here so we're going to get our first term let's is g inside here we're going to multiply it by the one on k and the e to the minus kt so we're going to get g e to the minus kt all over k our second term we've got uk sine theta times e to the minus kt all divided by k or times one on k and that's going to give us plus uk sine theta e to the minus kt all over k and our final term our minus g we need to times by the one on k now all of this we're integrating with respect to time and there is a common factor of 1 on k we probably should have pulled that out at the beginning but we can do that now so we'll, we'll pull out that we'll pull out the k now and we can sub in the y and the zero on the left hand side so subbing in y for y we get y minus subbing in zero for y we get zero let's pull the 1 on k out integral from zero to t and now we need to integrate g e to the minus kt with respect to time so there we're going to get g e to the minus kt and we just need to divide by the derivative of the power which is minus k same over here so we've got we just we're going to take all of this term because the only thing with time is our exponential so we're going to get plus uk sine theta e to the minus kt all divided by sorry, there should be no integral sign here before we're integrating now so this is all times and then we're dividing by the derivative of the power which is minus k and integrating g with respect to time we just get minus gt and this is all bound between zero and t we're going to get y equals 1 on k 
all outside. We've got to sub in t first, and we're just going to get the exact same expression. So we're just going to get minus g e to the minus k t, all on k, so just brought the negative out the front, minus u k sine theta, e to the minus k t, all on k, minus g t. So let's sell our first term, subbing in t. Now we can sub in zero. Subbing in zero for this term here, we're just gonna get e to the zero, which is one. So we're just left with minus g on k, minus g on k. Subbing in zero for the next term, this all becomes one. The k's will cancel out. So we're left with minus u sine theta, minus u sine theta, and then subbing in zero into here just gives us zero. We can close that off and close that bracket. And we're left with y equals one on k, all outside of minus g e to the minus kt, all on k, minus uk sine theta, e to the minus kt, all on k, minus gt, plus g on k, plus u sine theta. And we don't have any common factors here, and we can't really write this, this much nicer. And that will be our final equation to describe the displacement in the y direction. So now that we've looked on how, where these equations come from, let's, let's practice using them and see, see, what we can, see what we can do. Let's have a look at a question. I'm just going to draw the information as we read the question. Let's look at our x and y axis. So we have from a fixed origin with an initial velocity of 12 meters per second. So we're launching some projectile with initial velocity of 12 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees. And we know that the air resistance is proportional to the velocity. So the air resistance will equal kv dot or kv, sorry. And we know the constant of proportionality, which is that value of k, is equal to 0.4. And we're actually given the displacement in the x direction and the displacement in the y direction. So we know the displacement in the x direction is equal to u cos theta all over k outside of 1 minus e to the minus kt. And the displacement in the y direction is 10 plus ku sine theta all over k squared multiplied by 1 minus e to the minus kt minus 10t all on k. And these equations just come from what we derived just now. And the question is asking, what is the greatest height that the projectile reaches? The greatest height. So we know that the motion is going to look something like this and then decaying off. And the greatest height will occur up here. And whenever we're doing projectile motion questions, the greatest height always occurs when the velocity in the y direction is equal to zero. Because you imagine throwing something up in the air, it's going up, up, up. And if you're just looking at the, the y velocity, at this point, it has to equal zero because so it can start coming back down. So that's what we're really interested in. We're really interested in when y dot is equal to zero. So whenever we have a greatest height question, that's when y dot is equal to zero. And that would tell us all we need to do is derive this equation here with respect to time 
and find out when it equals zero. So let's go ahead and do that. But before we do that, we'll, we'll sub some values in that we know just to make it a little bit easier. So we're gonna have y equals, we have 10. So that value of 10 comes from, from gravity, using gravity as 10 meters per second per second. Plus, we know the value of k is 0.4 in this case. We know the initial velocity is 12 times sine theta. We know the initial, we know the angle it was launched at was 30 degrees. But we should have this in radians and putting in pi on 6 because we're using calculus with our trigonometry here. So put pi on 6. All over k squared, we know k is equal to 0.4 squared times 1 minus e to the minus k, which is 0.4 times t, minus 10t on k, which is 0.4. And this whole term here can all be evaluated with the calculator. And if you do that, you get 77.5. And that's all being multiplied by 1 minus e to the minus 0.4t, minus then 10 on 0.4 is 25, we get minus 25t. Let's expand out to 77.5, so times by one, we're just gonna get 77.5 minus 77.5 e to the minus 0.4t minus 25t. And this is much easier to derive now that we've subbed in than, than this initial Thing up here it's easy to see what we what we need to derive so let's go ahead and do that so we're going to get y dot so we're deriving now derivative of 77.5 is zero now to derive this we just need to multiply this because it's an exponential by the derivative of this so derivative of the power is just minus 0.4 and we're just going to get 77.5 times 0.4 well, we get minus 77.5 times minus 0.4 times e to the minus 0.4t and the root of minus 25t is just minus 25. Then we've got 77.5 times 0.4. Well, negative negative gives us a positive and that gives us 31. e to the minus 0.4t minus 25. And for the max height, we need y dot to equal zero. So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna have zero equals 31 e to the minus 0.4t minus 25. Now we need to solve for t. So we're gonna add 25 to both sides. That's gonna give us 31 e to the minus 0.4t equals 25. Divide both sides by 31. So we're just gonna get e to the minus 0.4t equals 25 on 31. Or 31. So we'll take the natural log of both sides. That's going to cancel out with the e inside. So we're going to be left with minus 0.4t equals the natural log of 25 on 31. Let's go ahead and divide both sides by minus 0.4. So we're going to get the natural log of 25 on 31 divided by minus 0.4. And that's going to equal... 0.53778 roughly and this isn't the greatest height this is just the time that the greatest height occurs so then if we want the actual greatest height we need to come back to our our equation for y and plug in that value of time and it will tell us our greatest height so our final value for y we're subbing in that value, so we're going to have y equals 77.5 minus 77.5 times e to the minus 0.4 times that value we just got, 0 0.53778 minus 25 times that value of time, 0 0.5378. And putting that all into the calculator gives us the greatest height of 1.56 meters. Uh -huh.